to Rex Corner. Today I have a medical doctor. He's my physician, uh, Dr. Mark Bronstein, and I asked him to come in because I've been to him for physicals and blood tests, and ailments, and uh, we've talked about testosterone, GH, and some of the good and the bad about that. And I thought, you know what? You're going to hear a medical uh, reason why it is good or why it is bad from the guy who knows. And so it's my honor to have Dr. Mark Bronstein here with me, and we're going to start talking about some of this stuff, right? That's right. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm humbled by uh, the presence of such a great athlete, <laughs> and I'm not a great athlete, so uh, don't use me as a role model necessarily. But uh, so I thought we'd talk about briefly anti-aging medicine and why is it suddenly in the last five or ten years so popular, and, and why it's suddenly an interest area for many doctors, and, and how testosterone therapy for the common person has become more and more popular and less and less skeptics exist as to as to its benefit and its side effects. So first of all, I was just going to frame the uh, anti-aging medicine in terms of what's happened in medicine in the last 115 years. If you look back at 1900, there was a guy at Harvard that invented uh, the concept of hand washing in between examining patients and internally examining them and uh, having blood on his hands and so forth and, and, and preventing prevention of disease. And this yeah. guy was nearly found to be insane and almost lost his medical license. because Why, he wanted to be clean? Yeah, oh. he, he, presented, he prevented the uh, spread of purple sepsis. It was an infection during childbirth and he dramatically lowered the death rates at Mass General Hospital at Harvard. And, there, and, and then went from being a, a fanatic and everyone thought he was crazy to receiving all kinds of awards and notoriety. And of course, uh, the germ theory uh, stands today. Uh, then hand washing to various public health measures we're all aware of. Like you go to third world country, you see those, those, the water running down this middle yeah. of the street in India. Those are open sewers and, and in oh, China and the countryside. And they just throw waste products in the rice fields. Here we don't do that. We have underground pipes and sanitation yeah. and that, that uh, eliminate a lot of disease, control pests, malaria, mosquitoes, etc. cetera. And, and, and so that was another big development. So in the 1915s, 20, 30, then came along vaccines, the concept from Louis Pasteur, the concept of vaccination. Right. And uh, prevention of disease through the uh, using the immune system to trick it into not getting sick with a vaccine. And the vaccine theory proved, of course, to be eradicate the feared diseases back in the 1920s, 30s, 40s in America, including polio, diphtheria. I had, my mom had a 10-year-old brother that died of diphtheria. Well, then, the polio thing, back when I was in grammar school, they give you the little stuff on a sugar cube. Yes. And you go through the cafeteria and eat a sugar cube, and that was your polio vaccination. Right. There's the oral polio and the shot. Yeah. The oral polio is probably a little more effective. The shot's a little less likely to give you polio. Yeah. So the Salk and the Sabin methods. Yeah. Uh, so, and then, and then my mom actually, she's in her late 90s. She was a public health nurse back then, and she used to hang the quarantine signs back in New York and trudge the snow and quarantine people that had tuberculosis, diphtheria, whooping cough. And she saw, she's telling me the story of all the deaths she saw back then. And, and, and everyone lived in fear of getting polio. She was a care of iron lungs. I remember that. They couldn't breathe with polio, uh, with uh, polio, etc. Um, and so we've gone through that horrifying, scary time, and and then antibiotics came along around World War II. The sulfa drugs, which were hard to tolerate, then the penicillin was invented uh, from a mold, and that was a revolution that saved countless lives. It was a miracle. And then uh, we began to check blood pressures in the fifties. In the 60s, and, and people had never heard of the sphygmomanometer. You know, what are you doing to me? Why are you pumping up that? Thing? You know, why you, what yeah. is a blood pressure? No one heard of it. There's no symptoms of high blood pressure. Then checking for diabetes and so forth. And, and thyroid function was a novel concept. It was very hard to test for hypothyroidism, um, especially subtle hypothyroidism or growth hormone deficiency or testosterone deficiency. And those have come all the way. So now we're at a point where we do all those things routinely in the human lifespan. Right. It's probably, you know, no one really knows, maybe 100 years now. 
compared to when Social Security came in around, what, 1965, the average person was felt to maybe live to be 65 and a half. That was it. Yeah, that was it. Right? And they, and that's where that number came from. If retired, you know, 65, and maybe you get a half a year of Social Security, and then you die. And you die. Now, <laughs> it's gone right past that, and Social Security's going to go broke. Yeah, that's the best way to visualize how long people are living compared to 1965. And I was born in 59. So when I was six years old, people were living a half a year past 65. Now they're living calmly to 100. Easily. Like, easily. easily. Right? And now the next stage is the anti-aging medicine, right. which are so-called anti-aging medicine. It's all anti-aging medicine. Yeah. If you die, you age pretty fast. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> so We prevent death, and we prolong a meaningful life. So next is testosterone therapy. That's a huge wave, as you know, across the country. And no longer just in athletes. No, it's, it's, it's uh, very common nowadays. But, you know, for a while the media got a hold of it and they said, uh, so-and-so died and we found steroids in his medicine cabinet. He died of steroids. And we know that didn't happen. You know, it was some other street drug or something else. Like some of the wrestlers, for example, yes, they all took them. But a lot of them were taking a lot of pain pills and alcohol along with it. But they wanted to blame it on the steroids. And it's been going on for some time because when it was legal years back in the 80s, uh, no one said much about it. But if you meet an average person on the street, you're working out, the first thing, you're not taking steroids, are you? You know they can kill you. And they have no knowledge of it. Right. No knowledge of what they're talking about. And then the growth hormones came along, which you and I have talked about as well. So tell me your feeling. You told me the other day in the office something about testosterone and blood and the heart. Yeah, so, so now testosterone is not just a, a dirty locker room sports-related topic that I knew nothing about. Now it's something I know something about. And I know that, that uh, it has many health benefits. And a lot of studies have been done at Harvard and other places that have shown improvement in cardiac blood flow. There were two landmark studies published in the Journal of Circulation, which is like the New England Journal of Medicine for cardiologists. So if you have a cardiologist, they all have the journal, they all read the Journal of Circulation. It's the number one. So there were two articles published about a year and a half ago in that journal. One was about how if you took patients that had blocked arteries, during angiograms, et cetera, or stents, and gave them testosterone that actually dilated their blocked coronary arteries and improved their cardiac function, the way the heart can improve contraction and better blood flow for these 30% yeah. 30, 30 better blood flow for block, partially blocked arteries in stented and non-stented arteries. Then there was another study followed up two months later that showed the actual muscle cells of the heart had a 30, about a 30% increase in oxygen oxygen um, delivery throughout the cell itself with testosterone. And so, and that even people with end stage, like the last bit, they're just hanging on by a thread, congestive heart failure. They're yeah. barely pumping at all, and they're in bed, and they're in edema, and you're saying even in the last rites, whatever. Those people had a, a significant improvement, maybe eight or 10% or more, which is a lot for them a better contractility of the heart. So they, their congestive heart failure improved. From taking testosterone? With testosterone. So all these things you hear about people dying left and right may be true, but it's not from testosterone. If it is, it's because it's not being dosed correctly and their, or estrogen levels aren't being followed along with testosterone blood levels. Or there's some other reason they're not following the hemoglobin and hematocrit, the, the concentration of the blood, how many red cells are there in the blood, and right. if it gets too thick, too viscous from testosterone, that can cause a stroke. So you have to adjust the dose to that to prevent that. So there's a lot of things that we've learned. Does taking blood thinners uh, counter that? Probably. I would say it's, uh, I, I was looking at a, I was telling Rick, I was looking at a previous um, show of, uh, on testosterone by a guy that knows a lot. It sounds like he knows a lot more than I do about the details of the biochemistry of it. But however, there's really no, as far as I can tell in the literature, no great proof that a blood thinner completely reverses the thickening of the blood from testosterone, the increased red blood cells. Yeah. In someone, it's the opposite of anemia. Someone has polycythemia, too many red cells. But it probably does. It makes sense. So fish oil capsules or blood thinners, they yeah. probably help. Probably baby aspirin helps. Yeah. And probably, and definitely, you know, blood donation works. To the yeah, I'm sure you know, donate like a pint a month and that works. <laughs> yeah, a pint a month or some people donate even three to four times a year. And it seems to be enough to where they get the benefit of the testosterone, which is mainly energy, improved energy and vitality and muscle strength and muscle mass, if you want that. Um, just a better quality of life. And they're willing to donate. So they become good donors. 
Yeah, it doesn't take it takes what a half hour or so and you're done. Yeah. They give you an orange juice and a donut, you go on your way. I see a lot of police officers. <laughs> yeah, these are a lot, a lot, a lot of highway patrol. They, these guys sort of it's a culture. They sort of like to donate blood. Sort of part of their spirit of you know serving the community is to to go to the Red Cross and they love to donate blood. The guys on testosterone. You don't need to do it three or four times a year. At least. Oh, you need more though. Uh, sometimes you need it every other month. Red blood cells live about ninety days. And when you donate blood, that lasts from 60 to 90 days. So you think about every two to three months would be enough. Okay. Um, uh, the things like Xeroto, that's a blood thinner, uh, which I take. Um, yes. Only because I have AFib, and they said, you know, for, for a irregular heartbeat, it's good to keep that from clotting. Um, but testosterone hasn't bothered me at all. I know my levels were a little high. Mm -hmm. And then you put me on Remedex to right. lower the estrogen. Right. So I think that helped. So if you want to get a strange look from your pharmacist, you get you take one of my prescriptions for a drug called Arimidex, which was which the package insert says for use in women only. And that's all. That's the black box warning. Women only. And you give it to Rick or you give this to me. I take it, and to lower estrogen levels to appropriate level in men, because the estrogen levels rise when you raise testosterone. Right, and it, and it holds more water. Exactly. So you want the estrogen level on the blood test to be between 20 and 30. So Arimidex lowers it. It blocks an enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen right. underneath the skin and the fat cells. And so you show that prescription, you take it to Rite Aid or some other big pharmacy, and they don't do a lot of testosterone. Yeah. And they look at you like, they, they call me, I get kind of calls from Rite Aid, CVS, the big chain pharmacies. They go, what is this? You're getting... A female, a drug for females or women, were not. I've had cases where they wouldn't fill it. Seriously. Whereas some of the smaller compounding pharmacies where you're used to. Yeah, they understand it. That's they know. Where I go. They understand that type of thing. They read up on it. They understand. They go to lectures. They go to seminars. They know. Now, you gave me a thyroid test, and, and we found my thyroid was low. Yeah. So there's another area in medicine that the threshold for diagnosing hypothyroidism versus lowish thyroid or high suboptimal hormone levels. So if someone may have suboptimal thyroid hormone and be sluggish and tired, constipation, weight gain, edema, but they don't technically meet the, the, the diagnostic criteria for t typical hypothyroidism, which is a random cutoff point. So now we're treating that more aggressively. Now the blood tests are more accurate. We usually do three, a panel, you need three blood tests. One is not enough, two is not enough. You need three, a TSH, a free T3 and a free T4. Right. Free T3 is the most important thyroid test. And um, every endocrinologist will tell you that the TSH, if you guys know what that is, and the T4 are the only tests that have been done. You have not been properly assessed for hypothyroidism. So the free T3 is the thyroid gland is the, the active thyroid hormone. Mm -hmm. It's best thought of, the most active. And it's the one that's going to cause symptoms if it's low like tiredness, you know, maybe if you're my age, 56, you might be desiring an energy level of maybe when you're 40, say. Yeah. Well, if your T3 is low, you're not going to have that. You give a little bit of T3 or free T4 then in a pill once a day, then you get that energy level back up to maybe when you were 30 or 40. And that's another anti-aging thing. So you can yeah. do the same, raise the testosterone, you cautiously raise the thyroid carefully. Yeah very carefully, optionally, and then growth hormone. Okay, let's talk about growth hormone. So growth hormone, uh, another area that athletes have uh, been familiar with for, for years and, and was associated with abuse. In fact, I think it's still illegal. I think it's illegal in Nevada to give supplementation of human growth hormone. You can't advertise it because it's a controlled substance. So I can't put right. an ad, you know, Bronst, uh, Dr. Mark Bronstein, growth hormone clinic. You can't do that. It's like Vicodin clinic. You can't advertise yeah. Yeah. controlled stuff. So it's still got a taboo associated with it in our society because it's been abused by athletes in the past to enhance performance. The problem is if you give growth hormone, just like testosterone, to say a 22 year old who's got a normal growth hormone level, and they take a shot every day. Now you've taken them to from normal and desirable to toxic. So it's as if they have a, a disease now, they have high, elevated growth hormone, and then it causes rage, cardiac failure, diabetes, things like that. It's very yeah. dangerous, just like testosterone. So if we give little tiny doses and it reverses the aging process to a degree, and the more year, I've been doing this for about four years, uh, maybe it's 
75 to 100 patients. Very expensive, but uh, uh, it's more expensive in Beverly Hills than it is in the Valley, but it's still very expensive. Because they can get it. They can get the money for it. A lower market. Right? Yeah, of course. So, 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 so uh, the typical dose would be the amount you would make if you exercise an extra two hours a day of walking or light jogging, that your brain, your pituitary would make that much if you just exercise two to two and a half hours more a day. Yeah. You gotta exercise and suddenly after two hours the growth hormone spikes up. So you gotta do that two hours. It could be divided twice a day, but two hours you'll get the same benefit as he is a shot that will cost you eight hundred dollars a month. Yeah. Once a day shot as you would for free for if you exercise more. But it, so you took someone and said, go exercise two and a half hours above what you're doing now and come back and see me in three months. Well, you'd see a different human being. They'd walk in the door and they'd look different. Well, also it's, younger it's and also because of the exercise. It's, it's, it's a two-way thing there. Well, that's true. Yeah, it's a two-way <laughs> thing there. So it's easier just to take the, what are you, one IU a day of the GH? Yeah, usually, you know, usually I, I usually measure it in milligrams, a very small amount. Like I said, maybe, maybe as much as you make in hour and a half, two hours of exercise. And what you see physically is someone that looks brighter, happier, just like with testosterone, better mood. If they have depression, they may, may be able to stop their antidepressants. Or I've seen cases where people have refractory depression and they, for the first time in their lives, were not depressed. Mm. Uh, so you, you maximize them together. You have to adjust the growth hormone and testosterone because they affect each other's blood levels. But, but very small doses, and, and you see women that used to do Botox and fillers don't need them anymore. Yeah. Their body's own collagen fills in those. So they save money in their Botox, and, yeah. they, and they look better than they did before. And it's like a total body lift. If you're looking for a visual, uh, wounds heal about 30% faster. A lot of surgeons, especially spine surgeons, are now recommending their patients go on growth hormone for a while so they can heal from operations. Well, I had a surgery on my head, and it's healed in a week. Yeah, so 30, 40%, well, 30% faster and better healing with, with, when your growth hormone. All right, so when you put it that way, when you're working out and you're tearing down your muscle, you're really ripping your muscle apart, it has to heal up. So it's going to be the reason why bodybuilders take it, because it heals faster and you get better results out of it. Absolutely. Same and, principle. And athletes and trainers, and sport, I'm sure you've known way before I did that this was a benefit mm -hmm. of growth hormone. For me, I look at it as you, you see the tired, sluggish person and I'm not in the greatest shape, but someone who comes to your typical patient, 50 pounds overweight, you know, two thirds of our country's overweight, yeah. with, with abdominal fat, they're pre diabetic, they have high blood pressure, yeah, yeah. the whole thing, the high cholesterol, and they need energy. They have no energy, they're kind of depressed and sluggish and like a couch potato. And they come in the next time with growth hormones, I feel better. Testosterone, I feel better. I can have sex with my wife again. I, men start waking up with erections again in the morning from yeah. testosterone. You give the growth hormone, and I start losing even more body fat and feeling even better. Right. So it's the whole thing all together, the thyroid, the growth hormone, and, and testosterone done cautiously, and they don't increase the risk of cancer. In fact, you could argue the opposite. They reduce the risk of cancer. Uh, and, and, and once you get past that mental barrier, this is the new wave of medicine and then stem cells. I don't yeah. do that yet, but intravenous stem cells are maybe yeah. the next wave. Maybe you say people live longer, live longer, but they not live their money. <laughs> That's right. You know, so long they go back to work. No income anymore, <laughs> exactly. I, I do everything right, just like you say, and I talk to the people that feel like I do. Even my daughter's 24, just walked in. In the middle of the afternoon, she gets tired, I get tired. I get real lethargic for like a half hour, hour in the afternoons. But that's just normal, isn't it? Yeah, and then... Course of the day? Well, that's that. many different factors. We live in a very high-stress society, so right. our brain's pumping out stress hormones. Many people have seen layoffs, and now they're doing the job of two people right. without a raise, so there's financial stress. We're all worried. The traffic's horrible in Los Angeles where we live. A lot of stress is a high divorce rate, all kinds of things. Yeah. And then medically, um, the, the brain may not even be getting the rest it needs. There's a guy, a story, and I think at uh, New York University, it might be NYU, but it could be Cornell, that just published a book a year ago about the history of sleep. And he meant it to be the definitive work on what is normal sleep for a human mm -hmm. being. And I saw him interview, he said the bottom line is that this thought that we should all sleep seven, eight, nine hours in a row a day is not I the way heard people this. slept. Yeah, I heard this. And it's called, by the way we normally would sleep through history since the caveman is by called bicameral, like a camel, like the two humps on a certain camel. 
two, two spikes. So you sleep three, four hours. Most cultures throughout time, and many today, they'll sleep three, four hours, get up, do their thing, go three, four hours, then go back to sleep for another two to four hours. It's called bicameral, so two humps of sleep with an episode in between. And that appears to be more what people have been doing for since time began. I, I think one of the things, for me personally, that tires me out, anybody who's creative, is when I sleep, my, my, I dream a lot. And my mind works, and it's always in color, and it's really vivid dreams about doing stuff. So it doesn't allow my brain to really rest. So when I get up, I'm still kind of tired from dreaming all night and thinking about stuff. I can't just shut off like some people. People that shut off, they go to sleep, they don't think about anything. I've never been able to do that. I get all my ideas in the middle of the night. <laughs> what ideas? I don't know. It's like just like weird. Show? Yeah, it's just like a weird. I think about the show and stuff. Uh, I have one more question uh, that you might know about a little bit, probably do. Uh, a lot of bodybuilders take insulin, and insulin activates their weight and their gains and this and that, but there is a fine line how to take that too. Yeah, so now that I didn't know. I did not know that bodybuilders use insulin. And a lot of them do, and they gain like 20 or 30 pounds of it. Yes, insulin is an interesting one. Insulin in diabetics, it has two uses. One is it tells your, it helps drive glucose into your cells for energy. And two, That's right, yeah. Two is it tells your body, hey, whatever calories are left over, store them as fat, because this guy's about to hibernate. Mm -hmm. It's the hormone of hibernation, sort of. It's got the two. So insulin also damages the lining of arteries. Mm -hmm. And when it's given as a shot, you get a sudden bolus of it. It can literally damage the lining of the endothelial cells of our arteries and cause atherosclerotic changes. So it's not good to be on insulin for anybody, even a diabetic. Yeah. Best to be on a, something that raises your own body's insulin naturally, which is much lower doses than we use in a shot. The body makes very little in 24 hours. Would that be IGF? So IGF is insulin-like growth factor one, and... It's similar in structure to insulin. Has some. It does stimulate um, certain receptors, just like insulin does. But it's not insulin. It's not no insulin. No. So IGF is insulin-like. Insulin-like. Right. Similar to growth right. hormone. Um, that well, that's I'm sorry. Insulin growth. Well, the main there are many growth hormones. By the main one we measure is made by the liver. Actually. Okay. It's called IGF one. Insulin-like growth factor one. And if you look at that, it looks like insulin, but it isn't. It does some has some similar function. Insulin's a peptide hormone, just proteins hooked together. No, no rings of any kind like cholesterol. Yeah. No, no steroid rings, and that um, uh, is made, of course, by the pancreas, and and that has different properties, but they have some overlap. It's it's really complicated. All right, so IGF IGF one there's IGF one LR three, which is longer acting. And if you take one, I was told one IU every morning where you train, it will act like insulin and growth hormone without the side effects of having downsides from it. That's, that's, say that one more time, that if you do... If you do, if you do one IU every morning of yeah. the IGF, it will stimulate muscle growth, reduce body fat, right. and all those things that insulin does right. without the side effects of actually taking insulin. That's true. Okay. So, so don't take insulin unless you're done directly. Right. I mean, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. You, Very dangerous. You get insulin shock and go to a coma. All kinds of things can happen. Or, or just simply damaging your arteries, or hypoglycemia, right? Going to a yeah. coma. Yeah. Really dangerous. Bad idea. Okay. No insulin. Well, you heard from the doctor. I mean, this is good stuff, and, and you can't get any higher than you to talk about this. And I just want you guys to take notice and listen to this. If you decide to do it what you want to do and how you're going to do it. And uh, we can reach you on your website. Yeah, it's uh, Dr. Mark Bronstein, MD.com. I'm in Sherman Oaks, California. Right. I'll put all that up so you guys can see it. Yeah, and I'm also on a weekly radio show called the Con uh, Rodney Conover Radio Show on the Internet uh, as a guest once a week for oh, half an nice. hour. Yeah, talking about political, medical, political things. All kinds of medical stuff. Topics. Yeah, you know. All right, Mark, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I really appreciate it. This is my doctor. I count on him. I had a little issue yesterday morning about uh, something I was concerned about. He texted me right back, come in and take a blood test. I'll let you know by the afternoon. I drove over. I was in and out five minutes, came back, went to the gym. That's how quick he is, and I really appreciate it. So Welcome. thank you so much for the, for the valuable service to me. I mean, and coming here and talking to my, my viewers, because I know they'll appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for watching Risk Corner, and stay tuned to the next time. Wait, don't leave. you got to say goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys.
rickdrayson.com. He is the equalizer, baby. See you next time.